Hi everyone. I want to first apologize for the delay since the last upload and provide an update on the current situation. At the very end of last month, one of my main videos was struck down and removed from YouTube, causing me to stop production, unsure of how to proceed. It was my understanding that these recap videos were valid under fair use, and I posited the same to YouTube. From what I found out, I was supposed to get a response in 24 hours, but surprisingly, I didn't hear back from them until about a week. Anyways, YouTube informed me that they couldn't make a determination either way, on whether or not my video was covered under fair use, leaving me right now, in a sort of a bind. Since I have continued to get requests from you guys, for more content, I have decided to start uploading along with instituting a few changes to the content. Ones I hope you will continue to enjoy, while simultaneously adding to the transformative nature of the content. I will also be creating a social media account for this channel, one I hope you guys can follow, so in the unfortunate event that this channel gets struck down, especially if it is related to this specific manhwa, and I decide to create a new channel with a different recap, you will be able to find me more easily. Thanks for your patience and continued patronage. I hope it all works out for all of us. Cheers! Now on to the recap. Last time, we finished the first arc of Muon's story, concluding with him going into seclusion to properly train in the secret martial arts of the Northern Sect. And now, we don't start with Muon, but instead, exposition. Seems legit since we started the first arc in the same manner. The White Dragon Merchant Troop is introduced as one of the ten great merchant groups in the nation. The strength of their wealth is said to make even the imperial family heed to their demands. Powerful, these lot, aren't they? They possessed numerous branches spread throughout the mainlands, which granted them tremendous influence over the nation. Although each of their branches were large enough to operate on their own, they had a headquarters that was located in a city called Menju, where they had total control over the city. Their control over the city was such that, it was difficult to find anyone that had no connections with them, or that wasn't aware of them altogether. This behemoth of an organization was founded by a woman called No Tate, the retired former leader. Despite her retirement, she had made an appearance for the first time in years, at the group's summit meeting, as we see the aforementioned titan of industry, sat at the head of the table. Everyone at the table silently waited for matriarch No Tete to begin the meeting. Next we are introduced to the youngest daughter of the white dragon merchant troop, Yun So Yin, as she is shown to be deep in thought about someone who had done everything he could to help her mother build the merchant troop from the ground up since he was young. A person who cared more about the merchant troop than anyone else, and the person in her thoughts is revealed to be her eldest brother, and the family leader, Yoon Ho Ma Hee Young. He was the one that No Tay Tay had entrusted the white dragon merchant troop to. Wait wait wait, Choto Mate. The matriarch is her mother and not her grandmother. How did she manage it? That's one strong lady. So Yin continued her thoughts, analyzing that since it had been a while since her mother last made an appearance at the meeting, the unusual nature of this appearance must mean that something had happened. Matriarch No Tete silently observed a bit more, before beginning the meeting with a question asking her eldest son for confirmation on the situation in Unnam being bad. Ho Ma Yi Young agreed with her, as So Yin reacted in surprise that her mother was there because of Unnam. This Unnam sounds familiar. I believe it's the city Mr. Huan described earlier, where one of the four, not so great heavens, had settled. So Yin recalled that when everyone wanted to withdraw from Unnam seven years ago, because of its management difficulties as a result of its distance, the person who had put everything on the line in order to establish a foundation there, had been one of her elder brothers, Tamai Young. 
We are then introduced to the third son of the White Dragon Merchant Troop, Yun Tama Yi Young. Tama Yi Young reacted with surprise, before responding to his mother's words, accepting responsibility and volunteering to go to Unnam to resolve their issue. But the family leader Ho Ma Yi Young rejected his suggestion, explaining to his mother that if his brother left his position in the headquarters, they would inevitably suffer losses, and that it would be best to send someone else to Unnam. Tama Yi Young then rejected his brother's rejection, claiming that their branch in Unnam was established by him, and as such, there was no one better suited to resolving the issue than himself. Ho Ma Yi Young's true reason for his rejection are revealed, as he noted internally that he understood how his brother felt, and that he was right in his reason, but that they had no idea just how difficult or dangerous the situation in Unnam was. Making him unwilling to send his own family member into such a situation, displaying his brotherly love and care, which was much different from where I was anticipating that this might go. Ho Ma Yi Young though was unable to express this thought, as he worried about the presence of his mother who was there to make an unbiased decision. Mate, I think she's allowed to be biased concerning her kid, isn't she? This difference in opinion between the brothers, sparked a bit of deliberation amongst the other participants in the meeting, as a few more candidates were put forward with different qualities, such as, the scholar of a hundred thoughts, and the master of the thousands. Hey hey, that character's nickname is incomplete. Thousand what? Our incomplete character was immediately eliminated from the running, as they also seemed to be incomplete in qualities, as they were stated to be talented in martial arts, but slow-witted in general. Ouch! Matriarch no Tete finally spoke, quieting the chatter in the room, as she called out to her son, Tamai Young immediately directing all attention towards her. She asked him if he really wished to go to Onnam, causing Tama Yi Young to once again reinforce his point that he was the most qualified and therefore, the most suitable choice to send. No Tay Tay agreed that it was natural that he would feel responsibility, before inquiring on who he planned on bringing along. Tama Yi Young answered that he planned to take the deputy guards, as well as the deputy general, Nam in jail and his men, which should ensure that they avoided any difficulties that they faced. Listening to his plan, No Tay Tay offered a suggestion for him to include one more person to his party, and take bodyguard Huang with him. Huang! I see. Are we getting to see Mr. Huang's job? I thought he was a merchant, but is he actually a bodyguard to merchants? Ha ha, I'm just imagining him misrepresenting his job to Mu Wan. He wouldn't do that, right? Tama Yi Yong reacted in surprise to his mother's suggestion, asking if she was referring to Huang Chiyo. Yep, I think that was Mr. Huang's full first name. Matriarch No Tay Tay replied that bodyguard Huang was a trustworthy person, and that in case of emergencies, they could use him to contact them. She then concluded with a concerned warning, imploring her son to take care of himself since the situation in Unnam was truly not an easy matter. Some time later, we see that the meeting had been concluded, leaving only two people at the meeting room. No Tay Tay asked her son if he was worried, causing Ho Ma Yi Young to admit that he truly was worried because of the lack of reliable information on the true extent of the situation in Unnam. Guess we won't be getting some exposition on this difficult situation any time soon. Matriarch No Tay Tay informed him that she felt the same way, before imparting some nuggets of wisdom on her son, explaining to him that just because it was dangerous didn't mean that the main family should avoid direct involvement, and that if the main family lost its spine, nobody would respect them and by extension the White Dragon Merchant Troop. She continued that during such difficult times, it was their duty as the main family to take the initiative and set an example for others to follow. Ho Ma Yi Yong respectfully accepted his mother's experienced words, before she added that she had faith in Ta Ma Yi Yong to do well, and that there was no need for her eldest son to worry so much. With their discussion over, 
she sent him on his way, asking him to summon bodyguard Huang for her. The family leader confirmed if she wanted to see him immediately, to which No Tay Tay nodded in response, as he left to fulfill her request. We see Ho Ma Young walking along the White Dragon Merchant Troop residence, deep in thought, as he considered bodyguard Huang Chiyo, knowing that he was not talented in martial arts, nor did he stand out from his peers, causing him to wonder what he had done to gain the trust and favor of his mother. As he arrived at what looked to be a training space, we see a number of people practicing in the courtyard. Next we see a boy gritting his teeth as he practiced along to the instructions of a man. The man provided instructions and guidance to the boy, correcting his faults in his martial arts. The instructor's face remained unseen, with the boy's sword conveniently obscuring it. Ho Ma Yi Young approached the two from behind. Ha ha, what is that expression from the kid? Without much surprise, the man is revealed to be bodyguard Huang, as Ho Ma Yi Young called out to him to get his attention, and we finally catch a glimpse of his face as he turned in response. Home, now I'm not completely sure. He looks quite similar to Mr. Huang, but seems. Younger? I'm not sure. He could be a relative, but it's the same first name Mr. Huang was introduced with. Hope we find out in the next chapter. We see a carriage riding through the empty plains, as the rider is shown to be bodyguard Huang. Then we flash back, or forward, to when he answered the summons of the matriarch, No Tay Tay. Bowing respectfully with a fist and palm salute, he asked why he had been summoned. No Tay Tay first asked how he was doing with Huang Chiyo responding that his life had been blessed because of her kindness. No Tay Tay stated that she was always thankful that he was there, causing Huang Chiyo to chuckle lightly, as he noted that he hadn't really done much. With the greetings and pleasantries out of the way, No Tay Tay informed him that her third son was planning on heading over to Unnam out of responsibility, in order to settle the current situation there and that she wanted Huan Chiol to accompany him on his journey, surprising him. The matriarch continued that seven years ago, her eldest son, Ho Ma Yi Young, had been able to escape an extremely dangerous situation, and then five years ago she was put in a critical condition, but miraculously survived. She explained that looking back on those incidents, it was clear that they had managed to get through safely because of Huan Chiol's presence. She theorized that it was her belief that Huang Chiol had been blessed with great fortune that allowed those around him to escape dangerous situations, and that she was a firm believer that good luck was a talent as well. Before entrusting her son, Ta Ma Yi Young to him. Ho, 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 she's not the matriarch for nothing, is she? She's over here playing for D chess, knowing that luck is a stat too. Plus if he really is Mr. Huang, then he's about to have a behemoth of an MC backing him, so it doesn't hurt to get on his great side. Truly the CEO of a corporation. We return to the traveling Huan Chiyo, as he mused that since he was leaving for his journey in half a month, he had to hurry. He also considered that the kid he was training, named Moon Jing, might follow them in the journey and get stabbed, as he made a mental note to increase the intensity of his training to prevent it from happening. As Moon Jin cried on the side at his teacher's negative notions. Traveling along, he observed remnants of a destroyed carriage laying along the road, lamenting the heavy presence of bandits in the area that caused even the Imperial Army to make a move. He did also note that surprisingly, he had never once encountered them regardless of how many times he had journeyed through the area, realizing that perhaps Matriarch No was onto something, as we see him approaching a mountain range. Next we see the snow-covered floor, as a person is shown to be trudging through the snow. We then get a full view of a familiar-looking person, with his body covered in scars, as he made his way through the snow-laden terrain, carrying firewood in tow. The person approached the foot of a mountain, as we see a makeshift home had been created inside the mountain, with a door, 
and a chimney attached. We continue to see scars along every inch of his body, as he set down the wood, and turned to a collection of broken blades. A loud shout from outside caught his attention and confirmed all of our suspicions on the identity of the man, and bodyguard Huang, as he turned towards the door and smiled. Muan exited the makeshift home, as he went out to greet Mr. Huang, and we get a confirmation of just how long it had been since he first arrived there. A seven-year time skip. We finally get a good look at Muan, and see that he had been hit hard by that post-puberty growth spurt, as he informed Mr. Huang that he had missed him. Mr. Huang looked at Muan's growth with pride, noting that it hadn't even been a year since he last saw him but he already felt like a new person, and that even if he died right now, he would do so without any regrets, as we see tears form around his eyes. I agree, you've more than fulfilled your duty in helping raise him. Jin Ku and Ho would be most grateful. The two exchanged greetings, as Mu Wan once again thanked Mr. Huang for all the support he continued to provide him, inviting him into the house to escape the cold. Mr. Huang mentioned to Muan that he had changed a lot since he had last seen him in the summer. But Muan simply laughed it off, stating that he was still lacking, and needed to be even more diligent in his training. Mr. Huang continued to marvel at Muan's growth, as we see him drinking tea while musing internally that the saying, a new day, a new person, was truly befitting of Muan's growth and that he had become a person that he was no longer able to fathom. With Muan also drinking his tea, we see that the artist had yet to bring his A-game, but with the sneak peeks we saw last time, we know he's definitely cooking something. Moving on, Muan stated that Mr. Huang had stopped by a lot earlier than he expected, causing Mr. Huang to explain that it was as a result of his upcoming mission to Unnam. Muan asked with worry, if something bad had happened, as he hoped this sudden mission wasn't anything serious. Mr. Huang assured him that he would be fine, and that in the worst-case scenario, he was more than capable of protecting himself, so there was no need for Mu Wan to be worried, before turning his attention to a separate room that had the broken swords we had seen earlier, as he asked Mu Wan about the sword sitting there. Muan explained that it was a sword he had forged using the meteorite Mr. Huang had given him all those years ago. He stated that the rock wasn't normal, and that it had taken him several years just to tame it. Guess they'll be referring to it as meteorite as opposed to skyrock from now on. How knowledgeable. Mr. Huang noticed that the blade was giving off a very sinister aura, but Muan simply brushed the issue with the sword aside as he asked Mr. Huang for the usual update regarding the current state of the world. Apologies for the next bit, we are about to get a significant amount of information, with little pictures, so just bear with me here. Mr. Huang responded first with an update on the incident from seven years prior. Explaining that the reappearance of the silent night had caused the world's politics to shake. The four not-so-great heavens, had become a huge presence to the world, causing the Central Heavenly Alliance to begin attempting to keep them in check. I would have expected Muan to have known this from the frequent visits Mr. Huang had made over the past seven years, but I guess this is for our benefit, huh? Muan analyzed that if the different factions were still fighting internally, then it must mean that the Silent Knight had yet to make a reappearance. Mr. Huang confirmed his words, explaining that the Silent Knight had gone quiet once more, and this had caused the Central Heavenly Alliance some degree of unease. Mu Wan and Mr. Huang continued their conversation, talking well into the night. The next day, Mr. Huang prepared to leave once again, reassuring Mu Wan that he would be fine, and that until the world witnessed the glory of the Northern Heavenly Sect once more, he would never fall sick nor die. Mu Wan saw him off, making his usual apologies for Mr. Huang having to journey all the way there for his sake. As Huang Chiu set out, he promised Mu Wan that he would return within three months, during the spring, raising all sorts of flags. Come on author, 
don't do this to us. Muan wished him good health, as Mr. Huang again reassured him that all was fine, raising those flags higher than the Empire State Building. As Mr. Huang left, we see Mu Wan watching from afar, perhaps feeling the flags himself, begging the author as well, not to execute them, before turning to look towards the sky with a sigh, as he wondered where Ha Seal was. Wow. He's still thinking about her, ha? Huh? Nice. We find out that three months had passed since Mr. Huang departed, as we see the snow melting off tree branches. He had stated that he would visit Muan in the spring, yet he had failed to. Another two months passed, I think, or maybe it's still within the previous three months, but they had gone past spring and into summer, as Muan, sitting on a large boulder, overlooking the vast landscape before him, began to seriously worry. Deep in thought, he was sure that Mr. Huang was in trouble, since he was someone who would never break a promise, before opening his eyes, filled with complete determination and conviction on what he now had to do. Muan grabbed his blade as he stood up, positive that something had happened to Mr. Huang, as we see deep groves, gouges and slash marks all around some boulders. Holy shite, scratch that, make that all around a few mountains. How did he get sword marks so high, just look at him relative to the mountains, he is a barely visible speck. Holding his sword in front of him, he summoned the shadows of before, as they finally surrounded him, and with a swift and purposeful move, he sent out a slash. Hells yeah, we're ready for a new journey. We get a full view of the eerie mountains once more, before, holy forking shite, the whole mountain range just blew up. The slash. Whoa 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 whoa. This dude just obliterated a frigging mountain range with a slash. Hells, forking, yeah. We see Mu Wan perform a move, reminiscent of the mighty caped baldy, perhaps he could be the one slash man. With the artist finally cooking, we get a view of the new look Mu Wan, all set and ready for his new chapter. With sword in hand, he declared that there was no need for him to wait any longer and that he had to go find Mr. Huang himself. Next we return to Nanju, the base of the White Dragon Merchant Troop, as we are shown a building with an outdoor sitting space. A man is seen snoring away merrily inside the building, as the doors were pushed open by a hooded person. The person's entrance caused the sleeping man to wake up, yawning as he welcomed the mysterious person. A quick once-over was enough for the man to judge the mysterious stranger as a beggar, as he pondered whether or not to tell him that they didn't have any available rooms. The stranger silently observed the man momentarily, before dropping a few coins that instantly lit the man's eyes up. Dude developed the merchant killer instinct, instantly teleporting in front of the unknown guest, as he welcomed him to the Crescent Moon Tavern immediately offering to take him to their best available room, coveted by nobles and the white dragon troop alike. A little while later, the stranger is shown to have checked into a room, taking off his cloak and baggage, as he lamented his journey. Stating that he had spent too long in seclusion, enough that his memories of the geographical locations had gotten foggy, amazed that he even managed to make it to Nanju. Mu Wan continued that it had taken him over ten days to get there, and it hadn't been easy. He opened the windows in the room as he overlooked the city, bemoaning his mistake and complacency with the whole situation, given that Mr. Huang was the person that had been with him the longest. Gathering his thoughts, he noted that all he knew at the moment was that Mr. Huang had worked as a bodyguard at the White Dragon Merchant Troop, but beyond that, he really didn't know much about the world. He concluded that he would simply be making excuses if he said that he was too focused on his training and was not able to come find him sooner, before apologizing and hoping that Mr. Huang was still alive. I hope the same as well, but those flags were raised so high as to be worrying. Someone is shown yelling, asking someone else to identify themselves because they had simply been standing and staring at them. 
we see Mu Wan approach the guards, before bowing with an apology, introducing himself as Jin, and explaining that he was there to find a boy named Quan Moon Jung. I guess he's not planning on using his first name for obvious reasons. The guard asked if he was referring to Moon Jung who was with the merchant guards, and how he knew him. Mu Wan responded that he didn't personally know him, but that his uncle had told him that he was close with Moon Jung. The guard asked who he meant by his uncle, as Mu Wan replied that his name was Huan Chiyo, causing the guard surprise, before smiling as he realized that Mu Wan was the nephew of Mr. Huang. Explaining that he had heard a lot about him, since Mr. Huang loved bragging about his nephew. Before continuing more solemnly, that if Mu Wan was here, then it must be because he wanted to know of Mr. Huang's whereabouts since it had already been six months since they last heard from him. I guess it was three, then two earlier, wasn't it? The guard then asked Mu Wan to follow him, as he led him into the White Dragon Troop estate, intending to take him to see Moon Jung, explaining that Mr. Huang always took good care of Moon Jung, and that since he didn't have much talent in swordsmanship, he just handled odd jobs for the merchant group. Looks like the kid didn't accompany them as Mr. Huang feared. Plus it sounds like Mr. Huang might have seen a bit of himself in the kid, huh? What with Mu Wan's dad giving him the chance to learn martial arts, despite not having much talent. Guess you should always pay it forward. As Mu Wan followed the guard through the estate, he noticed a group of three men sitting towards a side looking rough around the edges, and covered in scars, wordlessly observing them as he went along his way. They got to a familiar courtyard with people training their martial arts, as the guard asked Mu Wan to wait. He then approached a man standing and observing the training like an instructor, and whispered something to him that caused him to turn around in surprise, looking in Mu Wan's direction, and confirming that he was Mr. Huang's nephew. Approaching Mu Wan, he bowed with a fist and palm salute, introducing himself as Kung Jin Sung, the captain of the bodyguards, as Mu Wan did the same. The guard, having fulfilled his task, waved Mu Wan goodbye, returning to his duties as Mu Wan thanked him for his help. Kung Jin Sung confirmed that Mu Wan was looking for Moon Jing, before letting him know that he would be back soon. He then asked if Mu Wan was there to know the whereabouts of Mr. Huang. To which Mu Wan confirmed, before asking if he knew anything on the matter. Instructor Jin Sung massaged his chin as he began his explanation, stating that there was a problem in Unnam that caused the deputy guards and third master to head over there, and that the matriarch No had specially requested for Mr. Huang to tag along. Mu Wan, clearly upset, frowned as he asked why the matriarch would send Mr. Huang on such a dangerous mission, and why she hadn't assembled a rescue party to go in search of him after he went missing. Why? But of course to take advantage of his good fortune, in the form of summoning you, my dear boy. Instructor Jin Sung chastised Mu Wan for being rude, expressing that the matriarch was not a heartless person, and that Mr. Huang wasn't the only person MIA, since the deputy guards and the third master had all disappeared as well, causing a huge issue within the merchant troop. He continued that even now, the matriarch was constantly recruiting skilled mercenaries, with the intention of dispatching them all to Unnam, which explained the earlier presence of the rough-looking guys. Instructor Jin Sung explained that up until that point, the merchant troop had been operating on their own, having failed to receive any form of help from the Broken Fist troop who were the most influential group in Unnam, despite repeatedly requesting their help and cooperation. He concluded that this was the extent of his knowledge on the matter, before remembering and adding that they had also tried to bribe the Broken Fist troop with supplies and items, yet to no avail. It's starting to smell like the Broken Fist troop might be involved in this incident, especially with all the talk about problems in Unnam. Plus you would expect that he and his men might know Mr. Huang, since they were all members of the Northern sect, unless Mr. Huang was too small a character to know. Anyways, 
it sure seems like Demon Fist Cho Chunwo might be our first stop. Instructor Jin Sung maintained that the matriarch was doing her best to resolve the situation, seeing as she was desperate herself. Moon Jing, the kid from earlier, is seen running over to the two men, serving as the cue for Jin Sung to take his leave, as he left them to talk, mentioning that he needed to check up on the matriarch. Mu Wan stopped the instructor as he was about to leave, asking if it would be possible for him to join the party heading towards An Nam. He expressed his willingness to work any job, as long as he could make it there, as we see Moon Jing joining them, informing the instructor that he had completed his errand. Instructor Jin Sung carefully observed Mu Wan, before expressing that Mu Wan looked like he at least knew how to wield a blade, and would be capable of protecting himself. Before promising to put in a word for him. As Mu Wan watched Kung Jin Sung leave, a sound next to him caused him to turn around, facing the kid before him. Moon Jing introduced himself as he scratched his head nervously, before asking why Mu Wan had asked to see him. Next, we get some more exposition provided. Every year, numerous talented martial artists flooded the world of Murim, and from these talents, the best of the best were selected by the people in Murim to become part of a group that contained seven positions. This group was known as the Seven Lower Skies. We are then introduced to a smiling man called Mu Wang of Wise Judgment, even possessing a secondary nickname of Unending Wit. Wow, so many nicknames and monikers. It is revealed that he was unable to get elected into the Seven Lower Skies, however, his ability to think and analyse was almost unrivalled within the whole nation, showing just how talented he was. Really? Enough to rival the seeker of knowledge from the Nine Skies? Or his granddaughter? Probably not. And then there was a woman who had been able to single-handedly decimate several dozens of powerful men, as we see an ample-bosomed woman covered in scars, veins and muscle tissue, introduced as Che Yaku Ran of unnatural strength. Jeez. Look at those, scars. Finally, we are introduced to a martial sect that was made up of only a dozen wandering mercenaries centered around a martial master, called Yong Musung. With the right price, the group was willing to complete any job, no matter the difficulty. This group was known as the Iron Brigade, and the earlier Mu Huang and Yakuran were the vice leaders of the group. Our exposition narrator is shown to be instructor Jin Sung, as he observed and praised the tremendous aura emanating from both vice leaders, before observing even closer, and proceeding to praise even more tremendous assets possessed by Yakuran. What a pervy old gentleman of culture. We see a note been passed along the table, as Mu Wang accepted it, declaring that the contract was complete, before putting it away. The other party is shown to be matriarch No Tate, and family leader Yun Ho Ma Young, presumably hiring the Iron Brigade to rescue the missing people. The vice leaders got up with a salute, as Mu Wang excitedly declared that they had accepted the job and will be departing the very next day, while Yaku Ran wordlessly saluted. No Tay -te thanked them while nervously observing their strange demonstrations, as we see Yaku Ran wordlessly flexing her muscles, as Mu Wang also confidently proclaimed that they could thank them after they saved the third master. The matriarch asked if it would just be the two of them going to An Nam, as Mu Wang responded that there would be more of them, including the hunter of the dying breath, Im Jin Yop, the arrow of the setting sun, Dem Jin Hone, and the swordsman of the seven ways, Kung Sun Chang, as we once again see our earlier ruffians. Jeez. Even these guys get monikers. It seems everyone is getting a fancy nickname giving me a case of the FOMOs. Perhaps I shall go by, the narrator of the unending content. No? Maybe you can come up with a better one for me. Yes, you. But really, I might be doing these guys a disservice by judging a book by its covers, perhaps they are gentlemen and not ruffians at all.
Mu Wang excitedly explained as Yakuran continued to wordlessly demonstrate beside him that it would first be the five of them departing, and as for the remaining members of the brigade, they had followed their sect leader and were currently on a different mission, but the plan was to reunite with them along the route to Unnam, and so, there was nothing for the merchant troop to worry about. No Tete responded with relief, stating that she was less concerned now. But I on the other hand, am more concerned, I had thought her earlier sweating was in reaction to their antics, but is she all right? Instructor Jin Sung smiled excitedly at the realization that the entire Iron Brigade would be present, thereby increasing their chances. The vice leaders, with their current business done, excused themselves in order to begin preparation for their journey. After they left, Instructor Jin Sung, remembering his promise to Mu Wan, informed the higher ups that Mr. Huang's nephew had arrived and was requesting permission to follow along to Unnam. The still perspiring No Tay -te approved of his request, seeing no issue in allowing him tag along, making what could turn out to be one of the very best decisions she had ever made. Her son, finally unable to ignore his mother's condition, offered to help her to her room in order to rest, since she had been overworking herself. In front of the gates of the White Dragon Merchant Troop, a commotion was ongoing, as someone asked with raised voice, why So Yin was planning on going to Unnam. She responded that it was pointless trying to stop her, since she already made up her mind, giving us an idea on the identity of the arguing people. The family leader, an eldest brother maintained that he would not allow her to go on the journey when they didn't even know if their third brother was still alive refusing to repeat the situation where he had allowed his third brother to go in the first place. So Yin rebutted that she had studied martial arts at the Kung Dong Monastery, and was more than capable of protecting herself, as we see her gripping her sword with a determined expression. Ho Ma Young though, was having none of it, asking her why she stubbornly insisted on putting herself in danger, but before he could finish his rant, she replied that it was because of family completely stunning her brother into silence, and possibly resignation. We see that the day of departure had arrived, as the party set out on the rescue journey to Unnam, with Muon given his own carriage, as he made a solemn prediction that he had a feeling, nothing would go according to plan on the journey. Come on mate, don't jinx it. Or maybe do, because I wanna see Muon wrecking some people. But then again, this may be a big brain reverse flag situation. Anyways, things are finally beginning to move. The next chapter began with the caravan proceeding along a road, and we see just how many mercenaries and guards had been dispatched for the mission. As Muan silently rode along, someone asked him if he slept well, as we see that the kid, Moonjing, had tagged along on the rescue mission, able to ride a horse on his own. He continued that he had been so nervous that he wasn't able to sleep, chuckling nervously. Mu Wan stayed silent the entire time, not responding to the boy's question or worries. Moon Jing observed him, noting that Mu Wan was very different from Mr. Huang, as he appeared to be a lot calmer and more reserved. He wasn't deterred by Mu Wan's silence though as he continued his life story, explaining that this was his first time experiencing a large march, before, oh shite, he's actually going to give us his life story. Moon Jing explained that his father had been a bodyguard as well, but that he had died a couple of years ago during one of his bodyguard missions, very much like right now, which was why he was a lot more nervous than usual. He continued that Mr. Huang had always warned him that he would be the first to die if something went wrong, and as a result, started to train him on some cultivation techniques to prevent this. He noted though that Mr. Huang had never stopped nagging him, and told him to never slack off during training, concluding that he was thankful for Mr. Huang's guidance. Oh, so it wasn't his entire life story. Phew. I thought I might have made a joke in bad taste there. Safe who? His words finally caused Mu Wan to respond, asking him what cultivation technique Mr. Huang had taught him. 
Moonjoon replied excitedly, stating that it was called the three foundational cultivation technique, and that the key aspect of the technique was that, so long as he was patient and stuck with it till the end, it would put him on a path to becoming a martial master. He then explained with a slightly downcast expression, that even though everyone had said he was talentless, and to stop learning martial arts, Mr. Huang was the only one who understood his feelings and took extra care to train him, and this was why he always practiced as hard as he could, as well as his motivation for tagging along on this march, as he hoped that Mr. Huang was safe. That's quite touching. Mr. Huang perhaps really saw a lot of himself in this kid. Mu Wan looked in his direction, silently sizing him up, before advising him to stay next to him if anything happened. Moon Jung, surprised by his unexpected words, agreed nervously, as he wondered if Mu Wan was actually strong and dependable as a fighter, thinking that if something were to happen, wouldn't sticking with the Iron Brigade be the safer option? The members of the Iron Brigade are shown marching along, as someone tapped Mu Wang's shoulder, shown to be the apparently taciturn Yaku Ran, pointing in Mu Wan's direction. Replying that he had noticed him as well, Mu Wang of the Wise Judgment, wisely declared that compared to the other bodyguards in the march, Mu Wan was in a league of his own. He observed that there was something strange about Mu Wan's chi, that it was as if it was there, but not there at the same time. Ya Ran, as was typical of her so far, observed him without words. We see Mu Wan deep in thought, as the march proceeded. He considered how he should live his life going forward. Noting that so far, he had been living his life completely dedicated to mastering his martial arts, and that at the moment, the only things he wanted to do were to find Mr. Huang, and then in Harseel as well. But beyond that, what should he be doing after finding them? The Resurrection of the Northern Heavenly Sect Exacting Revenge on the Central Heavenly Alliance He pondered if that was truly the right path for him to take. Or perhaps it would be better to continue living the rest of his life as a non-existent being in the world, and prematurely end this manhwa and recap series. Considering all the various options before him, he suspected that his father would have wanted him to abandon any sense of resentment that he might hold for his betrayal, and just live a proper life, free from all worries. Yet, he considered if this was something he was capable of doing. Especially when the blood in his body boiled with rage. Unsure of the path to take, Muan thought about his father, before his thoughts were violently interrupted by the shouts of those around him informing everyone that the vanguards were stopping. You know, I really, really, love the scene just now. Actually, I can't express how much I love it. It's not often you see MCs have this kind of introspection in situations like these. He considers his options, the different paths available to him, the hopes his father probably had for him, and also the current state of his emotions. He may very well, as we all suspect, go for revenge, but this little scene here shows immense maturity from our MC, leaving me extremely impressed once more. And regarding his father, I just cannot unsee Garp from one piece when I see him. The interrupting voice continued with more instructions, informing them that they would be crossing a river to Unma in four hours, but in the meantime, they would be splitting into two groups that would take turns eating and resting while the other remained on watch duty. The person providing the instructions is shown to be instructor Jin Sung, as he passed out detailed commands. Next we see a building, as Mu Wan and Moon Jin are shown to be currently taking their break. A waitress came over to take their orders, as Mu Wan requested something simple and filling. The waitress is shown to be a young kid, as she happily provided a recommendation of pork stir-fry, making me feel a bit hungry. But alas, content must be produced. Moon Jing is shown to be completely smitten by the waitress, blushing profusely and gawking at her as she left to get their orders. Mu Wan, smirking, gave him a straight shot, 
asking if he was interested in the waitress, and completely taking him by surprise. Moon Jin unconvincingly denied the allegations against him. Next we see the members of the Iron Brigade entering the tavern, lamenting that they were starving. The waitress soon returned with Mu Wan and Moon Jung's orders, proudly advertising the tavern's renowned pork stir-fry, and revealing the establishment's name as the Southern Sea Tavern. Moon Jing drooled in anticipation, exclaiming that it looked super super tasty, as we see the unending wit, offering Yakuran a sit. I'd have to agree with you there kid. The waitress introduced herself as Hem So Ri Young, referring to Moon Jing as older brother while asking him his name. Moon Jing, surprised at her words, nervously introduced himself as well. The girl responded with excitement that Moon Jing was a bodyguard, expressing how cool it was, before cheekily adding that if she needed someone to protect her later, could she seek out Moon Jing from the White Dragon Merchant Troop. Moon Jing nervously replied that she could, still blushing, as we see Mu Wan, like most of us, just smiling at their interaction, on his way to getting diabetes from all the sweetness floating around. Moon Jing even managed to throw in a light brag, in between their pinky promise. The tavern door opened once more, as little So Ri Young welcomed the new arrivals, informing them that she would be right with them. The new patrons are shown to be three men, or rather, two and a half men, who walked into the tavern, observing Mu Wan and Moon Jing's table as they walked by. Um. That was not a joke on his height but the TV show. All heights matter. Anyways, this situation smells like trouble, doesn't it? The guy in front couldn't look any more like a stereotypical villain if he tried. The unending wit came to the rescue, providing us with an introduction as they ate. He observed that they must be ascetics from the Kung Dong Monastery, suspecting that the kid with them was probably someone of high status, since the monastery was known to not allow young disciples venture to the outside world, and only made exceptions if the disciple had either attained a high level of mastery in their martial arts, or had become a first-generation disciple. Is it me or does this kid have a bit of a derpy expression? Probably me. Mu Wan this time, threw Moon Jing a curveball, asking him if he was jealous of the high-status kid. But Moon Jing, this time, was able to beat the allegations, casually replying that he wasn't in the slightest, as he enjoyed the taste of his food. He explained further that he was satisfied with being a bodyguard, continuing that his father had once said that although they were being paid to protect people, it was still a duty for them to ensure the safety of their owners as well as their belongings, and because of this, people placed tremendous faith in their abilities, and relied on them since their lives were built on living a humble and honest life. For this reason, Moon Jing stated that he believed that there was no other job more magnificent than being a bodyguard. Mu Wan, listening to his monologue, smiled at his words, impressed with his father as he stated that he was an honorable man. This poignant moment was suddenly disturbed, as someone yelled out for the cook of the tavern. Three guesses as to who is disturbing the peace. Unwilling to overcome his fate as a villain character, the man defaulted to type, yelling for the cook to show himself. After not having someone immediately teleport there at his whim, he asked if he was being ignored. Not long after, a man is shown exiting the inner room of the tavern, with the waitress in tow, he began to ask what the problem was, before suddenly stopping short as a quick glance informed him to his shock, that it was someone he knew. The still-shocked cook was immediately nailed in the face with a plate of food, causing the waitress, his daughter, to cry out in concern for her father. The villainous monk exclaimed at who the cook was, showing familiarity enough to know his name was Hem Tape Young. He explained that while eating their food, the future heir of the Kung Dong Monastery, Sol Kung, had broken his teeth. Nani the fork. He broke his teeth on what? How hard did he bite? We see the earlier kid grabbing his mouth, that contained a chipped tooth. 
The villainous monk continued to rage, asking if this was Tae Pyung's way of taking revenge on the Kung Dong Monastery. As we see what is presumably, a piece of the kid's broken tooth. The villainous monk continued to yell, calling the cook a few choice names, as he asked him how he intended to take responsibility for the situation. The kid continued to wince, lamenting the loss of his precious tooth, and the pain he was in. Tape Young, while wiping his face with a piece of cloth, tried reasoning with the villainous monk, asking why they were still bothering him, even after he had disassociated himself from the monastery. Failing to realize that logic and reasoning never works with idiots like this. As we all expected, the monk chastised him for making excuses. Tape Young explained that he always performed quality control on the meals before they were served before suggesting that perhaps the villainous monk was still holding a grudge from what had happened between them in the past. We find out that 15 years ago, there had been a tournament arc, usually held every three years, and in this tournament, our cook, Hem Tape Young, had defeated his senior brother in the monastery. Although he had offered a hand in the spirit of competition, our villainous monk, named Mu Hei, had been resentful, knowing that as long as Tae Young remained in the Kung Dong Monastery, the much-coveted title of highest peak of Kung Dong would never be his. For seeing a future as second place, tacked onto the humiliation he felt from losing in the tournament, Mu He began to plot, never forgetting, and a few months later, succeeded in implicating Tae Young in a scandal that resulted in his meridians getting forcefully destroyed, and then being kicked out of the monastery. Are you fucking kidding me? Dude, you won. Why the hell are you still unhappy with your life and bothering him for it? He lamented that despite his success in eliminating Tape Young, the ugly scar that the defeat had left in his heart continued to ache, causing him to burn with rage. Oh, I see. Your ego can't handle it. Hem Tape Young zeroed in, painfully hitting the nail on the head as he surmised that only Muhei's pride had been affected from the events of that day, but him, he had been wrongfully framed, lost his reputation and his ability to practice martial arts. Before asking if there was really a need to continue scorning him after all he had taken. My point exactly. What more do you want mate? This is as obvious of a, take the win and go, before you lose it moment, if I've ever seen one. Tape Young then turned to the kid, asking him directly if he really broke his tooth from eating the food. The kid in turn, asked if Tape Young was accusing him of lying. Pointing out that his teeth was clearly broken, and causing him pain. Jeez. These monks. We see the third monk fussing over the incident, stating that if someone called Master Tay, found out about the incident, it would become an even bigger issue. Next we get confirmation that it was all really a setup, as the fussing monk asked the kid, Sol Kung what happened to his tooth, and we find out that the real cause had been Sol Kung tripping over some roots and breaking the tooth while training with Mu Hei, showing that they were all in on it. Tape Young, understanding what was going on, bit his lower lip in frustration, lamenting the bleak future of the Kung Dong Monastery, noting that they had lost their way so much so that not even a trace of their master's teachings and beliefs were left, seeing their willingness to resort to lies. Muhei, completely overtaken by rage, could barely form his words, before deciding that he could no longer look past Tape Young's arrogance, and attacking him with a palm strike that sent the cook flying. This guy is something else. Why are you so angry? It's all true, right? So Ryong ran towards her father who had slammed hard enough into the wall to dent it, causing blood to pour out of his mouth. Crouching next to him, she yelled at Mu Hei, asking him why he was harassing her dad, as tears flowed down her eyes at her father's condition, begging him to stop hurting him. The white dragon troop bodyguards that were present, although put off by the actions of the monk, turned a blind eye to it, unwilling to unnecessarily get involved. 
Taking matters into her own hands, Hem So Ryung charged at the monk, grabbing him as she yelled that their claims were false, and that she had been the one to prepare all the ingredients, making it impossible for a rock to have been in the food. So that earlier object was supposed to be a rock, not his chipped tooth. Muhe silently considered her for a moment, before backhanding her hard enough to send her flying, for daring to lay a hand on his sacred body. Your sacred body? What's this guy on? All I know is... Your ass whooping shall be entertaining. That being said, as horrible a moment as this is, his expression isn't half bad. Witnessing what the monk had just done, the taciturn Yakuran finally spoke, bellowing in rage, as she got those doflamingo veins popping all over, cursing at the monks. Just as she was about to get up, the unending wit placed a hand on her shoulders, stopping her. Mu Wang asked her to calm down, explaining that the Kundong Monastery was one of the great families that was a part of the nine great sects, and becoming enemies with them would put their Iron Brigade in a difficult position, before finally adding that even still, the actions of the monks were getting out of hand. At such a crucial moment, our boy, Quan Munjing stepped up to fulfill his pinky promise, as Mu He asked who he was. How brave. Or stupid. We see Munjing, scared out of his wits, enough to be visibly shaking, answer that he was a bodyguard. I guess it's brave then, since he understands the danger. Observing his attire, Mu He inquired if he was from the White Dragon Merchant Troop. Asking if he was unaware of the relationship they shared. Moon Jung replied with a request, asking if Mu He could please bestow his grace as a monk, just for this one time, and look past the stone incident, as his shivers intensified, with nervous sweats running down his face. Mu He laughed at his words, declaring Moon Jung to be chivalrous, before abruptly stopping his laughter, as his expression changed. Stating that if Moon Jung phrased it that way, then it was almost as if they were the bad guys in this situation. Um. You think? Reverting to type, he questioned the audacity of a lowly bodyguard, who received money to exercise their martial arts, to stand before an ascetic of the Kung Dong Monastery. Moon Jing, hearing his words, latched onto his criticism of bodyguarding as he emphatically explained that the duties of a bodyguard were deeper than that. Expressing that it was an honourable job that held significant value. Unwilling to listen to his lecture, Mu He unsheathed his sword, cursing at Moon Jung for not only standing before him, but also daring to lecture him, as he promised to teach him his place. Although, he did magnanimously add, that he would show him mercy by only cutting off one of his arms. Geez. This guy's exaggerated sense of importance, I can't even. Mu Wan, like us, unable to take in a more of Mu Hei's BS, stood up, surprising the unending wit. He ruffled his hair and sighed, realizing that he was going to have to catch a body to end this tomfoolery. Yakuran looks as though she's barely containing herself as well. Mu Wang once again chimed in imploring Mu Wan to not be foolish and to simply turn a blind eye, especially since Moon Jing had interfered when he shouldn't have. He stated that it was unfortunate, but Moon Jing would be punished for his ignorance, and there was nothing they could do to stop it. Concluding that at the very least, he wouldn't lose his life, and that he should be lucky to escape from the situation with only his body and pride maimed. Mu Wan questioned the wisdom of Mu Wang's words and judgment, revealing that the moment a martial artist lost their arm, was tantamount to the end of their life. Before completely abandoning his decorum, stating that pride was something even dogs had. Continuing that true pride was found in enduring the hardships of being utterly alone, as you did everything you could to fight for your beliefs, as we see Moon Jing gritting his teeth in terror, tears filling his eyes watching the incoming attack from Mu Hei. Mu Wan then turned to the unending wit, scathingly declaring that it was something that he would never understand. Guys, I know talking is free action, 
But how about we have this conversation later, before our boy, Moon Jing, gets killed? Mu Wang, ignoring me, angrily asked why Mu Wan was only looking at the tree and not the entire forest. Asking if he truly planned on becoming an enemy of the Kung Dong Monastery with such an idiotic belief. Mu Wan, choosing not to ignore me, asked why he couldn't, as he instantly accelerated, fast enough to disappear from the panels, appearing in front of Mu Hei, as he caught his attack with two fingers. Hell's forking yeah. Does anyone else hear funeral music? Mu Wan finally responded with a question of his own asking Mu Huang why the world shouldn't have at least one idiot willing to risk it all for his beliefs. Ending the chapter and this recap there. Thank you for watching. Please comment, like and subscribe for more content.